Good morning, and welcome to Grace Baptist Church. Glad to have you here with us online. Uh, Once again, I am speaking to an empty auditorium. Uh, It's hard to picture your faces here, but generally most people sit in the same places Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, so I can still see the Dritters over here and the Walters over there and my parents, and you know, I can still imagine you guys still being here, but it's still not the same thing. So be praying, please. Be praying for our local officials, our our governor, and for all those in charge right now of when we can meet again. So please be praying for that. Uh, This morning we will be looking at Matthew 26. We'll be looking at Judas's preparations in betraying Jesus, his bargain that he made. And we'll also be looking at Jesus's preparations for the last Passover. And there's a contrast there that we're looking at again this morning with also the contrast of Mary who put herself at the feet of Jesus and, and gave him that precious blessing. So this morning, our call to worship is this. Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and because of your will, they existed and were created. So that's what we're meditating upon this morning. We're looking at this call to worship. Worthy are you, worthy are you, our Lord and our God. We should be praying that way. Our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things. You're sovereignly in control. There's no maverick molecules. All things that were created. Therefore, he has rule and authority over them all. Every last aspect of that. Created all things, and because of your will, they existed and were created. Let me open just with a a prayer for our our governing officials. And uh, also, if you'd just be mindful of those within our congregation who are not able to actually watch this uh, through the Internet. Uh, I just met with Curly Ashby this morning. And visited him. He is not able to get online. He has no internet access. So he's not been able to enjoy uh, the teaching that we've been putting up online or the website. So if you'd be praying for him, if any of you have any solutions to that, uh, love to hear them. If we can minister to Curly in any way. So be, be mindful of that. Those who are shut in, who are alone. And um, mindful of all of us, Lord, that we'd be sheltering in peace. So let's pray right now for our officials. Father, we do thank you. For our governing officials, Lord, we thank you for our president, for our governor, for our sheriff. Uh, Lord, those right now who are making decisions, Lord, that affect us in the shelter in peace time right now. So I just ask, Father, that you would bless them with wisdom, Lord, that you would watch over them and guide them. Father, we long to enter into fellowship again on Sundays, a regular day of worship, and just to set it aside, Father, to step back and to see that you are ruling and reigning over all of your creation. So please, we ask for your guidance, Lord, and your wisdom in all of this, Lord. We would like to be back in fellowship, Lord, meeting face to face, enjoying the sweet fellowship of the saints, the brothers and sisters in Christ. So we ask, Father, that you would please guide and direct, that you would show your favor in this And also, Lord, that you would expand the gospel through what we're doing right now, through the internet, Father, that the gospel would go out, that it would be heralded, that it would be proclaimed, that Christ is to be exalted as Lord of Lords, King of Kings, and the Prince of Peace. So we ask, Father, for your favor in this. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Then also, I would like to just give us an opportunity now to pray corporately, um, online, corporately as a church praying for God to attend to the preaching of his word and the receiving of his word. I hope that all of you are staying in a consistent, op- the consistent time of a steady Sunday morning fellowship as families, as individuals, that you're still doing that. Uh, even though we have to do it on this, that you set aside that special time, that regular time on Sunday mornings, Lord, that you're up, that you're ready, you're dressed, uh, you've had your breakfast, and you're ready to worship the Lord through, through the songs and and through the word that is proclaimed through our equipping hour ministry, all the things that are on our website, I would just encourage you all to just set aside Sunday morning is that time uh, that you meet together in your, own, in your own houses and whatever possibilities you have for that. So right now, I'd just like you to ask the Lord to bless our time, bless the preaching of the word and the receiving of the word, that he would send his spirit to attend to what we're about to do now um, in this empty auditorium, and as it comes into your your houses, as it comes to you, I just pray that just pray that the Lord would attend to it with His Spirit. Please, would you do that for His glory? Dear Heavenly Father, I do thank you for the prayers of your people. Thank you, Lord, for what we're able to still do, Lord, meeting together, Lord, over the internet. 
uh, Lord, through Zoom and other things. You have still blessed us, Father. The, the word has not been silenced, nor have we been told that we cannot preach the gospel. But Father, there are these times right now, Lord, that makes us anxious for what is the future to hold for us, what you have for us to do. So I'm asking, Father, please, for your favor, for your favor on your people, for your children. Lord, that you would grant us your favor in allowing us to come back together, to meet again, Lord, in sweet fellowship, face to face. Lord, enjoying the fellowship that we have experienced in the past, Lord, that it would go on into the future. Lord, as just a fragrance of what it will be like in heaven, Lord, when we enter into the marriage supper of the Lamb. Lord, we just look forward to that. May we be focused upon that in Revelation 19:7, Lord. Those who are invited, those who come in, the beautiful preparations that you've made for your bride. So, Father, please help us to focus upon the kingdom to come, that your will would be done, that your kingdom would come here on earth as it is in heaven. So, Father, please bless us with an understanding of that. And, Lord, please set our sins aside at this time. Father, help us to be mindful of those things, that you give the gift of faith, that you give the gift of repentance, Lord. Help us to repent of those sins, Lord, that bind us and that encumber us and stumble us. So, please, set our sin aside right now. Set my sin aside, Father. Please forgive me. Lord, for those things that have plagued heart and mind, Lord, please, that I might be your mouthpiece now, that I would be a servant of Jesus Christ and a steward of your mysteries, and that you would receive praise, honor, and glory. So please, let us meditate upon your word this morning, and please fill us now with your spirit to open and illuminate your word for us. Please teach us, guide us, lead us into all truth. We ask for your blessing, for your glory, and for our good. We ask it through Jesus' name. Amen. And you know, that's a beautiful picture there again in Revelation 4, 11. Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and because of your will, they existed and were created. Let's take a look at our text this morning. I'd like to read it to you, starting in verse 14 of Matthew 26. Let us focus on Jesus and how he prepares for what's about to happen, and that he is sovereign over all of these things. So let's read Matthew 26, 14, all the way down to 25. Then one of the twelve, named Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What are you willing to give me to betray him to you? And they weighed out thirty pieces of silver to him. From then on, he began looking for a good opportunity to betray Jesus or to hand him over. Verse 17. Now on the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says, My time is near. I am to keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. The disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. Now, when evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve disciples As they were eating, he said, Truly I say to you that one of you will betray me. Being deeply grieved, they each one began to say to him, Surely not I, Lord. And he answered, He who dipped his hand with me in the bowl is the one who will betray me. The Son of Man is to go, just as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good For that man, if he had not been born. And Judas, who was betraying him, said, Surely it is not I, Rabbi. Jesus said to him, You have said it yourself. You are the one, is the correct, would be a literal translation of that. You are the one. You said it yourself. You are the one. Contrasts. Matthew loves contrasts. He likes to contrast things. And again, when we looked last week at this text, just for way of review, We looked at the plot to kill Jesus and then the the preparation for his burial. When Jesus had finished these words, we've seen this huge contrast that Jesus had just set in front of his disciples the glory of the Messiah coming, the glory of the kingdom coming, him coming in, in in victory, him coming and establishing his kingdom. And then just after that, as these words had finished, all the words he had said to his disciples, you know that in two days... The Passover is coming. So he puts this beautiful picture of his kingdom coming. Then he says, but you know in two days the Passover is coming and the Son of Man is to be handed over for crucifixion. So he goes from this glorious picture to this utter humiliation. The most humiliating way to be killed, to be cruci- was to be crucified. 
And that's what he says he has to go to. And he's already predicted that. We went over that last week, the eight, eight, um, eight episodes where he tells them explicitly and inexplicably throughout the Gospel of Matthew, he's told them eight times that this is going to happen, giving more and more details each time as it, as it came to this account where he tells them, I've got to be crucified. And then across town, the chief priests are actually going about that, planning that. But they don't want to do it on the, on the Passover, during this Passover feast. They want to stay away from that. There's some of the details that we need to look at and understand about, about when this actually took place, when he actually ate the meal. They don't want to defile themselves. They don't want bodies hanging on crosses before the Passover. So they appeal to Pilate. And again, Caiaphas is a politician. Caiaphas held his office for 18 years because he was a politician. He wasn't a a true high priest. He was a politician. He was in league with the Roman Empire. We saw that last week. I read you the account of some of the historical events behind that to see how he jumps off the page at us. But again, the one who we want to focus on is Mary who jumped off the page last week. Mary jumped off the page. She was the one who anointed Jesus and prepared him for burial. He's at the house of Simon the leper. And this would have been a humble estate for him. Here's someone who had been a leper. He more than likely healed him. And he goes into this man's house. And Mary is there. Martha's sister. Lazarus' the sister. She breaks this vial of costly nard perfume and anoints his head and his feet. She uses her tears to wash his feet and to dry them and to anoint them with this perfume. This would have been the lowest uh, responsibility of one of the servants. No one would have wanted to do a foot washing, and she washes his feet. And we see that illustrated that, that she liked to sit at his feet. She liked to learn from him. All the way over in Luke 10, we saw that, that when Mary is sitting at his feet and Martha's making all the preparations, she complains. She says, Jesus, tell Mary to help me. Jesus says to her, Martha, Martha, Mary has chosen the better thing, and she's sitting at his feet. And so last Sunday, a Mother's Day, we, we looked a little bit at um, Monica, who was Augustine's mother, to make the tie to Mother's Day, that she was a disciple. Yet she didn't live during Jesus' time. And we want to take the illustration of Mary really quickly and just understand that again, is that we can put ourselves at the feet of Jesus. It's a, it's a Hebrew idiom. When a Hebrew idiom is a saying that would be, you put yourself at his feet, you put yourself under his authority, you put yourself under someone's teaching. Even though they've passed, you're putting themselves under their teaching. So Jesus' teachings are still for us. They're recorded. The inerrant, infallible word of God is still given to us so that we can put ourselves at the feet of Jesus. We can study the word of God. Uh, Dr. Barnhouse was once on a train one time, and he was sitting in a, in a car with a, a man who was a noted theologian, and the man who was riding in the car with Dr. Barnhouse was, was reading his Bible, and Dr. Barnhouse is reading his newspaper. Dr. Barnhouse noticed what he was doing and put his paper down and says, I wish I knew the Bible like you do, sir. And of course, the gentleman responds with, well, if you would read it, you would know it. And Dr. Barnhouse took the, took the encouragement, the the exhortation, put away the paper and started reading his Bible. And Dr. Barnhouse became a a notable theologian uh, that we can trust today. And so again, putting ourselves at the feet of Jesus, putting ourselves under the teaching of the word, taking the time that it takes each and every day to learn and to read God's word, to study it, to meditate upon it. Uh, Each and every day is what we need to be putting ourselves to. And to be like Mary, to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, to put ourselves at his feet, daily putting ourselves at his feet. And so there's a contrast here. She gives this precious, precious gift, a year's worth of wages. And now as Matthew makes a contrast, because he's taken this from the account six days before the Passover, brought it into where this is now two days before the Passover. And I believe one of the reasons is, is to show a contrast between Mary's discipleship and Judas's discipleship. You have Mary who gives a most costly, costly, precious ointment, perfume, An heirloom, probably, something that was precious to the family. But she knew that this was her opportunity to honor her Lord and Savior, to honor her rabbi. And then you see Judas selling Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. That's the price of a slave, a fraction of the cost. So this morning, I want us to see that contrast. I want us to take into account the contrast between Mary, a true disciple of Jesus Christ, who sat at his feet, and Judas, who was with Jesus for the entire three years. And this is a warning to us, too. This is a warning that goes out to us. We can sit in the church. We can participate in all things and take communion and learn and always be here. 
But have we truly committed ourselves to Christ? Have we truly become his disciple? Are we truly sitting at his feet? And so there's, there's a warning in this as well as we see the life of Judas being played out in front of us and as we see Jesus making the preparations for his precious disciples to celebrate this Passover meal with him. So in verse 14 we read this. Then one of the twelve, named Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What are you willing to give me to betray or to hand him over to you? And they weighed out, or some versions say they coveted with him. They made a covenant with him. We're going to give you this, but here's the terms of the deal. You have to betray him to us. You have to tell us where he is. We need to find him secretly. So they made some kind of a deal, made a covenant. They covenanted with him. And they weighed out these 30 pieces or these 30 shekels of silver to him. And again, that's if, if you look back into Exodus 32, 21, um, you see that if, um, in Exodus, you see that when someone's ox gored a slave, you had to pay him this amount. This 30 shekels of silver was the amount that you would pay someone if they gored your servant. If they gored your servant or your slave, you had to pay them that amount. So that's a tremendous thing to see that here, in, so that's back in Exodus 21, 32. You see here that that is the price that Judas wants. So Judas was there in the upper room. Judas, or Judas was there during this precious ointment. When this ointment was poured, they said, why this waste? Why this waste? Why this year's worth of waste? This could have been sold and given to the poor. Of course, we know that Judas was the one in charge of the money box. He was the accountant for the disciples. And he was stealing out of the money box all the time. But notice, we'll notice in this text this morning before us that nobody suspected him of that. Nobody suspected Judas. They, they're all aghast when Jesus asks that question or makes that statement to them before the, during the Passover meal that they don't know who it is. They don't know that Judas is the one that's portraying Jesus. They have no idea. And so he's getting away with it. So in Exodus 21, 32 is where we read that when an ox gored a slave, you sold them or you gave them, I'm sorry, you gave them 30 shekels, 30 pieces of silver in exchange for that slave. A fraction of the cost of what Mary had given in that ointment, in that precious perfume to anoint Jesus, to anoint his feet. She gave a year's wages. And here's Judas saying, what will you give to me? What was the motive behind Judas? So we compare these two accounts. We look at these two things and we say, what was the motive for Judas? Judas was a lover of money. Judas loved money. So we're warned by that. Do not hold on to the things of this earth. Do not love riches. What will a man give for his soul? Mm. Judas sold his soul for 30 pieces of silver, the price of a slave. And Jesus does come as a servant to seek and to save, as one who will give himself as a ransom, as a servant, as a slave, to be sacrificed. But still, Judas sells himself for 30 pieces of silver, from then on, he began looking for a good opportunity to betray him, to deliver him over, to turn him over to that. And this is the preparation that Judas has made. Judas has gone out and done this. He's preparing for this. So that leaves us some details. That's what shadows some of this and what Jesus does in this next account preparing for the last Passover. So as we look at this, he says, Now on the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? And so there's some different accounts here. When we look at the Gospel of John in 12 and 13, um, we see that these, these, uh, this is a similar account of that anointing and of also of this time of preparation for the Passover meal, that they're preparing for this. And so Jesus has already made preparations for this, but he says here in Matthew that this is the, the first day of unleavened bread. In the other accounts, we see there's some different details in the chronology Suffice to say that some theologians have argued over whether this is Thursday or Wednesday. I'm more inclined with the fact that this is Wednesday, where others would say it's Thursday and we hear nothing about the Passion Week on Wednesday. I would say this is actually Wednesday and the Passover meal was celebrated a day before um, for various reasons that, that I will we'll discuss as we go through this. But suffice, suffice to say that this is on a Wednesday and that there's some different issues there with regards to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. 
But John, again, gives us the details. Also, the Pharisees did not want to put Jesus to death. When he goes through the trial period of this, that will be on a Thursday because they don't want to enter into the Friday when the Passover begins. And there's a Sabbath on, on the Passover on Friday, and then there's the other Sabbath on Saturday. So neither one of those, do so they want anything on the cross. And they don't want to step into Pilate's domain. And so we see that this has to happen before the Passover. But Jesus will be crucified uh, just prior to that just like the lambs will be crucified in the city. And again, there's no mention of the lamb here at this Passover meal. So there's some controversy there, but I would just say that it's more than likely Wednesday and that Jesus actually is in the tomb for three literal days as he's already proclaimed back in Matthew 12 when he talks about Jonah being in the belly of the whale for three literal days, three literal days, not just time gaps, not just portions of the day that we would accredit that through Jewish timekeeping. So suffice to say, those things were there before us. We don't follow the skeptics or the liberals and say that there's confusion. We just say that on the accounts, uh, they have different aspects. Again, Matthew and Mark put things in different order to highlight their their issues. Here, Mark is making contrasts. Contrasts. You have Judas preparing to betray Jesus. And you have Jesus, through this, preparing to celebrate the Passover. Preparing to look at the work upon the cross. Knowing that Judas is going to betray him. Knowing that he is there to fulfill Psalm 41, verse 9. That the one who eats with him will be the one who, who betrays him, who will lift his heel against him. He's going to sit with a friend and be betrayed by a friend. That's the thing that we need to fathom this morning. Just thinking about that. Is it possible that we could be betrayed by a friend? And Jesus gives Judas every opportunity to repent of this. He confronts him and gives him every opportunity to repent. But here we are in this unleavened bread. And the disciples came to him and said, where do you want us to prepare this meal? Remember, there's upwards to two and a half, maybe three million people in the city. Where do you want us to prepare it? We haven't made preparations yet. It's going to take us a couple of days. There's a lot to get ready. We have to figure out, you know, the lamb. We've got to prepare a lamb for this. We've got to get all the other preparations. Um, There needs to be the cake made or the, the paste out of figs and pomegranates and nuts and apples. It's got to be made down into a paste and then cinnamon sticks, which will be in commemoration of the bricks that they made in Egypt. Because this is all a celebration of them coming out. The exodus, the time of the exodus celebration. And where they left and where they commemorate those things. Where they, they have little bits of salt water to remind them of the bitter tears that they suffered in Egypt. And also the crossing of the Red Sea. And that they'll also have four cups of, of wine to commemorate Exodus 6, 6 and 7. Where he says, I'm going to make a covenant with you. I'm going to take you out. I'm going to free you from these things. There's four cups that celebrate each one of those phrases in Exodus 6, 6 and 7 that needed to be prepared as well. And then they also prepared a place for Elijah. Elijah was supposed to come. The best place at the table would have been for Elijah. And then someone would have went to the door to see, hey, is Elijah here yet? So all these things need to be prepared. All the elements of the Passover Seder dinner need to be prepared for that. And we'll look at that again when we get to 26 next week. We'll look at those elements. We'll look at all the, uh, the aspects of this. But there's a lot to be prepared. They need to prepare these things. And so they're asking Jesus, where do we go and prepare these things? It takes time to do all that. We need to go prepare a place. And in this, we'll see that Jesus has already made arrangements for this. He already knows these things needed to be taken care of. He already knows this, and he's already made a preparation. And he's kept it quiet so that more than likely Judas won't know. Judas can't know where they're going to celebrate the Passover. He might be betrayed there at that Passover celebration. And so Jesus is keeping this in incognito and just a little bit of uh, keeping it quiet and letting them know that here's what you're going to do and here's what you're going to do. I'm not going to tell you exactly where it's going to be held because there's Judas. Judas is right there in the midst. Judas is right there in their midst now. Because when it said now, he's back. He's made the deal. And the top of verse 7 where it says, Now on the first day of the unleavened bread, Judas is back there. All the disciples are together again. Judas has made his preparations to betray Jesus. Now they're all together again. And they're saying, where do we celebrate the Passover meal? And so they have to go find this place. And so we know from John, from the Gospel of John, that Jesus tells them to go into the city and you'll find a man. And he's going to be carrying a pitcher of water on his head. And it's just like, you think about it again. How many people are in the town? In Jerusalem, two and a half million. How are they going to designate one particular man from all the other men of the town? And he says he'll be carrying a pitcher of water on his head. Now, not to be mean to the ladies in the room or on the internet, but the way that that would have been a striking thing for them is that was the task of women. 
Women were the ones who carried water on their heads. So it would have been out of place to see a man in the city as, the, as, as Passover is coming with a pitcher of water on his head. This would have been something that would have stood out to them. They would have seen this. It would have alerted them. Hey, there's a man carrying a pitcher of water on his head. That's woman's work. Don't get upset. It's just the text. We need to understand that. We don't see it here. We see it in John 13. But they were told to go. It says, go into the city to a certain man. That's the man he's talking about. A certain man. And say to him, the teacher says, my time is near. I am to keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. That's what they're to speak to him. That's how Matthew records it. That's how Matthew records it. I'm supposed to, they're supposed to go. And they find it that way. They find the man, they find the upper room, and there's things that are there prepared. They need to clean it all up. They need to get all the yeast out of there. They need to make the unleavened bread. But they've got to make sure that there's absolutely not even a speck of yeast in this place. And in the Gospel of John, it says it was ready. There were things that were already done in preparation for that. But they go, and it says in verse 19, it says, The disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. But I want to point out something. If this is on Wednesday... There's no lamb. There's no mention in the account of a lamb. There's bread and the cups. And so Jesus will take one of those when we get to verse 26 and we talk about the Lord's Supper. And we'll talk about that next week. And just the significance of what we see going on there as far as a rabbi doing the Passover. But they went and they were directed. They prepared all the elements for the Passover. They put them in place and they were ready for Jesus to come. And now when evening came, so Wednesday evening, when evening came, Jesus goes into this celebration. Jesus goes in to celebrate this meal. He had looked forward to this. This is something he longed for with his disciples, to celebrate and to eat this meal. And he still waits now to do that again with us. That's what he says at the end of this section. When he, does, when he institutes the Lord's Supper, he's still, still waiting to do this. He longed for that with his disciples, and he longs for that now for his disciples for those who are his disciples now and those who will be the disciples from all of time, those who have faith in Christ. He longs for that. He's waiting to celebrate this again. That's something we also need to keep in mind and meditate upon, that Jesus is waiting. He's waiting to celebrate with his bride, with his people, with the redeemed. He wants to call us home. He wants to come and get us. He wants to bring us in. He's made preparations. It's ready. It's ready for us. And now when evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table. He was re- reclining with his disciples around him. There would have been disciples close by him, in intimate relationship to them. Like John on his breast, listening to Jesus, listening to his teaching, enjoying the sweet time of fellowship. So this was an intimate time. This was a, a close-knit time. This was a time where they enjoyed this fellowship. So when this comes, it's like a bombshell to them, the question or the proclamation that Jesus is about to make. This would have been an intimate time. This would have been a calm time. This would have been a peaceful, peaceful time. There would have been a low luster of us. It would have been a, a joyful time. And no regards for danger. It would have been a peaceful time. And as they were eating, he said, here comes the bombshell. Truly, truly, I say to you that one of you will betray me. Wow. It's like, wait a minute, we're celebrating the Passover meal. This is is a beautiful time to celebrate what had happened in Egypt and how they were freed and how the blood of the lamb was put on the doorposts and the angel of death passed over them and they were freed from Egypt. This is a time of celebration. This is a time of, of great looking back and remembrance. This is a time where they celebrate their communion with God. And he says... One of them is going to betray them. This is, this is like a bombshell going off in the middle of a peaceful moment. Jesus, boom, truly I say to you that one of you will betray me. Wow. And they were deeply grieved. This was amazing. They're like, wait a minute. We've, we've been with you for three years. We've given up everything. We've been your disciples. We've followed you. We've seen all that you've been doing. Remember, Judas is still there. And this is after Jesus has already washed their feet. When we look at the other accounts of the Gospels, we see that Jesus had already put a towel around his waist. He'd taken, out his outer, outer, taken off his outer garments. He put a towel around his waist. He filled a bowl full of water, and he had washed their feet. He had washed Judas', Judas feet. And he had told them, you've got to do the same thing. You've got to be servants. You've got to serve one another. Of course, Peter makes that statement. Not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. And he goes, you don't need a, an entire bath, Peter. You just need this done. 
Do likewise. Do likewise to the brothers and sisters. Do likewise to this. So he'd already done that. That had already happened. We looked at that from the, we look at that from the other gospels, from the other accounts. Mark 14. Being deeply grieved, they each one began to say to him, Surely not I, Lord. Surely not I. Surely it wasn't, surely it's not me. They don't argue, they don't say, I would never do such a thing. They're not indignant about it. They're grieved. They're sorrowful. It's a, it's a small, humble, uh, uh, humble statement that they bring to Jesus. They bring him into a humble state. Surely not I, Lord. Surely it wouldn't be me. I've been with you all, all of this time. Remember, they all had been with him all three years since his baptism. They'd been with him. And Jesus had picked them. He'd gone up on the mountain and he had prayed with the Father. And he picked all 12 of those disciples. All 12 of them. Including Judas. Including the son of perdition including the one who had made the plan to betray him. And they each one say, surely not I, Lord, surely not I. Now, if they had, had suspected Judas, they would have pointed him out. That's one of the reasons why we know, that, for, and from the other, other accounts in the Gospels, that Judas was not looked at with disfavor. Nobody knew what he was doing. Nobody knew that Judas was pilfering from the money box. Because they say, which one of us? I can't. They had no idea. Because if they... Think about it. It's just kind of an argument from silence. It's not recorded anywhere. But wouldn't they have pointed to Judas? If they thought it was Judas, wouldn't they have pointed to him? Wouldn't they say, well, you know, he's stealing from the money box. It's got to be him. They surely not I. Each one of them said that. And he answered, he who dipped his hand with me in the bowl is the one who betrayed me. So he's basically saying it's somebody here. He's not pointing out Judas. He never points out Judas. He's giving Judas an opportunity to repent. In some regards, think about this. He's giving Judas the opportunity to repent. Judas is going to follow the wickedness of his heart. He is totally depraved. He is, he is corrupt. Satan's going to enter into him. His heart is going to find that which he wants. He wants money. He is following an evil desire. He has plotted to do sin, and he's not about to stop doing it now. Again, that's a warning to all of us. Do we plot to do sin? We know this is wrong, but we're still going to do it. Yes, we, we took communion this week, but we're still going to do it. We sat in church all, all the days of this month, but I still want to do this one particular sin. I still want to follow after this thing. I'm still plotting to do it. I'm not going to listen to the Spirit on this. I'm still going to do this one thing. He says, he who dipped his hand with me in the bowl is the one who will betray me. So he, he makes it general to all of them. He doesn't point out Judas at all. He never points out Judas. They never suspect Judas. Even when he leaves, they think he's going to go give some money to the poor. He never gets pointed out. But it's the one who dips his hand with me in the bowl. The Son of Man is to go, just as it is written of him. But woe to that man whom the Son, whom the son of Man is betrayed. He's going to go. He says the Son of Man is to go. The Son of Man is to go to the cross. That's been ordained before the foundations of the world. But for the foundations of the world, he has been ordained. The Lamb of God was crucified, who wrote the Lamb's Book of Life that your names are contained in, if you have faith in Christ. The Lamb who's slain before the foundations of the world, before the foundation of the world, is to go. He is to go to the cross. That's God's plan. That's God's sovereign plan for Jesus. It says, the Son, of, the Son of Man is to go, just as it is written of him. And one of you will betray me. One of the twelve is going to betray him to fulfill Psalm 41.9. The one will lift up his heel. The one, who, the one who is his friend, who eats at his table, who is intimately with him. Judas is sitting there right next to Jesus, right there at the table, reclining on one another. They're all f- sitting there, reclining on each other, laying onto each other's chests and eating the meal together. But just as it is written of him, just as it is written of the son of perdition, just as it is written of him, this is proclaimed that this will happen. Therefore, it must happen. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. Woe to him. Cursed is he. Anathema is he. Cursed is he. Cursed is this one who betrays the innocent one, who betrays him. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. That's an amazing statement there. It echoes back to what we see in verse 46 of chapter 25, where it says, These will go away into eternal punishment eternality. There's no universal, universalism here that stands up to that text where Jesus says, it is better if he had never been born. It would be, have been good for that man if he had not been born. Better if he had never been born. 
Not everybody's going to be saved. There's no universalism. There's no, there's no redemption. There's no clearing out of hell. There's no annihilationism. It'd be better if he had never been born because he's going to suffer eternally in hell. Satan's going to enter into him and he's going to follow out his evil desires. His depraved heart will enter into that. He's been given chances to, to repent. He's seen the ministry of Christ all, for all three years. He's seen everything that the Lord has done. But when the ointment was placed upon him, when Mary placed the ointment on him, he was like, man, this is not going the way I thought. I thought this was going to be a wealthy kingdom and there would be us, all of us 12 would get inheritances here on earth. There would be, there would be riches for all of us because the Messiah is here. He's going, to, he's going to establish his kingdom. There's going to be wealth. But here he won't even stop Mary from anointing his feet with a year's worth of wages that that would have cost. We could have sold that, put it in the money box. I could have pilfered from it. And these guys would have never known. I was really good at it. Sorry, I'm talking like Judas. Not, I'm not talking like myself. I'm talking like Judas right now. This was the intents of his heart. This is what he, he followed after. If God doesn't do something to us, if he doesn't take that away, we follow that. We follow that sinful nature. We follow it. We feed it. We think about it. We won't put it out. We follow after those desires and we want that sin and we plan for it. We prepare for it. We're not about to let it go. That's what Judas did. He planned for it. He prepared for it. He got the 30 pieces of silver and he wasn't going to let go. He'd feel remorse later, but it wasn't repentance. Here I want to point out that Jesus is giving him opportunities to repent. Giving him opportunities to repent. So if it's left to us, think about that for a second. If it's left to us, as Jesus is leaving it to him, where do we end up? We follow the wicked desires of our heart. If it's left to us, again, God's sovereignty is over this whole text, over this whole event of 26, 27, 28. He's showing that he's in control of all this. He's given Judas every opportunity. He's been with him for three years. He's seen everything. It's like one of us. We're in the church. We've been in the church all of our lives. God's given us every opportunity to repent, but we're still following after these things that we want in the world. Yeah, we go to church on Sunday. We go to the prayer meeting on Wednesday. We, we do all the things that are on the weekly calendar, but there's this, these things that I still want to do. There's these things in the world I still want to, I want to have. There's these riches I want to have. There's these things I lust after, and I, I need to have them because God is not my all in all. Christ is not my all in all. He's not sufficient to satisfy me. Oh, but he is. Oh, but he is. But left to ourselves, as Judas was, where do we end up? We end up in this case. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. And Judas, who was betraying him, said, Surely it is not I, Rabbi. Kind of a, a pious, satirical way of saying that. Surely it is not I, Rabbi. Not just, surely not I, Lord, as the other disciples. But Judas says, differently than the other disciples, if you notice. Surely it is not I, Rabbi, my teacher. No, I'm under your authority. I would never betray you. It's not me. It can't be me. He's putting on a good show again. Putting on a good show. But it is him. And Jesus says to him, you have said it yourself. Yes, it's you. Yes, it's you, Judas. You have made a deal. You have made a deal with the devil. And he had. He'd made a deal for 30 pieces of silver, the price of a slave, and sold Jesus into their hands. He would feel remorse later on. He would throw the silver into the temple. The Pharisees, the chief priests, would gather it and go by the field of blood for a burial place. He would commit suicide. That's yet to come. But here is Judas. Judas was betraying him. He had fooled everybody. He was trying to fool Jesus. And in this account where he says, yes, surely it is not I, Rabbi, it's like this intimate reaction where Jesus says, yes, it is you. You have said it yourself. If anybody in the room had have heard that, wouldn't they have attacked him? Peter is the one who has a sword. Peter's going to go and cut off Malchus's ear in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's shortly coming up in the account here. He'll take off the ear of the high priest's servant, Malchus. They have swords. They would have probably killed anyone who they known if Jesus had revealed it. So if this would have been spoken in, a, in an audible tone to the rest of the disciples, if they would have heard, you're the one, yes, it's you, it's you, Judas, you got to think, you got to assume, I know we get in trouble with assumptions, we've got to assume that they would have taken him out. 
that Peter would have taken him out. Somebody would have taken him and bound him and not allowed him to leave that Passover meal. But Jesus quietly says to him, yes, it's you, Judas. I've brought it to your attention, Judas. I know what you're about to do. You have an opportunity right now to repent of that. You have an opportunity to stop the plan right now. You have an opportunity to see that this is wrong and stop now and not just be remorseful of it later on and kill yourself, but to repent now, to repent of it, to turn and to turn to Christ. He was not following Christ. He was following his own lusts and desires. He was following after money. He had the greed for wealth. He had given up his soul for riches of the world, which were going to perish and rust and be destroyed. And he had given his soul for those things. That's what sin does to us. That's what sin will do to our souls. If we sell ourselves out to sin, when God comes to us, when a brother and sister in Christ comes to us and says, do not pursue this plan, this plan that you're contemplating, these things that I see evidence in your life, I'm concerned for you, please stop this plan. We say, oh, no, 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 no. I'm not doing anything. And the brother and sister is trying to love you in Christ. The brother and sister is trying to help you in Christ. I hope you come to me when you see that. Because I might be blind to that. Hey, why are you pursuing that, 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 that goal? Why are you trying to hold on to these things? Let go of them. Your soul is in jeopardy. Your soul is in jeopardy. Let go of that plan to follow that sinful way of life. A lot of the illustrations that come out of the theologians in this section is the the young people in the church, of course. Not that I'm pointing all to the young people. The young, the old, the old, old, all have the same problem. This is though you go to youth group, you do all the things that you should do, but you still want to sow your wild oats. You still want to go out there. You still want to engage in a relationship. You still think that well, he's an unbeliever or she's an unbeliever. I can still engage in this relationship because they'll get saved. God says, do not even consider that. When they make a profession of faith, when they're in the fellowship, when they follow Christ, then they're someone you can pursue and pursue them because they're pursuing Christ. Two people who are both pursuing Christ come closer and closer together because they're like-minded, but they have one focus, one Lord and Savior, one baptism, one spirit, in both of them, bringing them together. So don't think that those things go beyond God's notice. God notices those things, and he gives us warnings. He brings to us parents. He brings to us brothers and sisters in Christ to help us. Here in the text, Jesus is giving the opportunity to Judas. He's saying, it's you. Nobody else is hearing. He's quietly confronting Judas, quietly doing that. Nobody else hears just Judas and him. So they're intimate. They're close. He's probably on his chest. Where's John? I don't know, because he's the disciple Jesus loves. Where is he at? He went off to get some food. And Judas is there with Jesus in this intimate relationship. And Jesus is quietly, privately, within this big group, all the disciples there during this meal, he's quietly saying, Judas, it's you. If we hear the voice of God when we put ourselves at the feet of Christ, when we hear from the word of God, it's you. Listen. God is telling us, listen. Listen. It's you. Repent. Repent of that. Let it go. How gracious our Savior is. How gracious he was to Judas. He's warning him to turn from this. In some regards, it's not explicit. This is all implicit in the text. But again, notice that. None of the other disciples hear this conversation. Had they heard Jesus say, yes, it's you, because that's the literal way to take that translation. You have said it yourself, literally is, yes, it's you. That's the literal way to take that translation there. Yes, it's you. Had anybody else heard that, they'd have killed him. So privately, he's giving Judas the opportunity to repent. Privately, when we put ourselves at the feet of our Lord, when we're a disciple like Mary was, when we disciple at the feet of Christ, when we put ourselves under the word of God, he speaks to us through his word. He says, let go of that. That's worthless. That 30 pieces of silver, that's worthless. That vial of perfume that costs a year's wages is worthless. Those things are trifles in comparison to glory to come. The trials we go through, the things we hold on to, 
are trifles, rubbish, compared to the glories of heaven, to the eternal life. Back in 46, it says, but the righteous into eternal life. The righteous go into eternal life. What is that righteousness? As I mentioned, he comes back for his bride. One of the areas that I continually look at and meditate upon in this life, because it's extremely encouraging, as we start finished our eschatology class, it was again back into the end of Revelation in Revelation 19, verse 7, where it says, Let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Next week we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about what he does during this Passover meal after Judas leaves. After Judas leaves, he's going to make a, a, pro, a proposal. Next week we're going to see a proposal that Jesus makes to his disciples, to his bride, to his church the church that's going to come from these disciples. But here we see this. Let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to him for the marriage of the Lamb, the marriage of the Lamb, the Passover Lamb, the Lamb of God. Throughout the book of Revelation, this Lamb is standing there. John turns around and sees the the lion from the tribe of Judah who's worthy to open the scroll that's in the Father's hand, and he sees a lamb with the marks of slaughter. Constantly the lamb is in charge of everything that unfolds throughout the book of Revelation. And here you see the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was given to her, it was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. The righteous acts of the saints. The works which were prepared beforehand that we would walk in them. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. Through a gift of faith were created in Christ Jesus, or his workmanship, but to do works that he prepared beforehand that we would walk in them. God is sovereignly in control of those. Righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, right blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Blessed are you who are invited. The invitation goes out. The invitation goes out to come to Christ, to turn away from the the desires and the lusts of the world and to turn to Christ, to repent. These are the true words of God. Then I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, do not do that. I am a fellow servant of yours and your brethren who hold the testimony of Jesus. Mm, Who hold the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. He's corrected by this angel. John is. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. That's how we prophesy. It's a small s. That is the spirit of prophecy, the testimony of Jesus Christ. What has Christ done? He's given you faith to believe in him. He's given you that faith. That wasn't your own manifestation. Had that been your own manifestation, what about Judas? Had it been something we create on our own or we come to a knowledge of or we, we put ourselves in the power to do that, why wouldn't have Judas done that? Three years he was with Jesus. There's still that warning for us. That testimony of Jesus is what Jesus has done. He sovereignly chose us. He sovereignly put us in Christ. He sovereignly gave us the gift of faith to believe in him. And we acknowledge that so that he's glorified, that he is lifted up. He is exalted, honored, and praised, that he receives the glory and the honor and the power, for he is worthy of that. Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. He is worthy of that. Let us think about these things. Let us meditate upon the marriage of the Lamb. What are we looking forward to? Entering into the marriage of the Lamb. He is whispering to us every day. He is calling us to repent. But he's calling us in a gentle, kind, and loving way, saying, I have something much better for you. We have to believe that he exists and that he is the rewarder. He rewards us. As the author of Hebrews would say, he rewards us. So let us meditate upon those things. Let's look at this picture, how God is in control of all this. As Judas was preparing his plan, Jesus was preparing the better sovereign plan of the cross. So would you please pray with me? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for what you revealed to us, Father. We thank you for the beautiful picture of Christ, Lord, his intimate relationship with his disciples, how he loved them and cared for them, Lord, how he watched over them, And even with Judas, he called them to repentance. But even in the life of Judas, we see that we cannot manifest faith. It must be given to us. You must break those things, Father. You must rip our hands off of the things of the world. Judas sold his soul for the riches of the world and had remorse. Father, we don't ask for remorse. We ask for the gift of repentance. 
It is your gift to us, Lord, that we repent. It is your gift to us that we turn to Christ. It is your gift to us that you whisper quietly to us. It's you. You've made a plan to sin. Forsake that plan and hold on to Christ. Hold on to the one who has died for you. Hold on to the bridegroom. We look forward to that great celebration, Father. We look forward to the marriage feast, the marriage celebration of the Lamb. May we be thinking that way, Father. May we be meditating upon that as we live this life here. Please, Father, bless your people during this time of shelter. Please bless them, Father. Strengthen them, comfort them. May we be richly, Father, may we be sitting at the feet of Christ during this time. Help me to do that, please. Help me and your saints, your, my brothers and sisters, until we are able to join again. Bless your people, Father, for your glory and for their good. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Benediction. So go and listen to the last song, Greater Than We Can Imagine. Come back. And here's your benediction from Philippians 4.23. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. May his grace fill your spirit. And as you have received grace, may you be giving grace out. As we receive grace from God, in an abundance, lavished upon us. May we be those who give out grace in wonderful measure, in full measure. So, may the Lord bless you and keep you. We are dismissed.